This is the Dairy Download, brought to you by EverAg Insights and the International Dairy Foods Association, where we offer extra sharp market and policy insights on dairy. I'm your host, Phil Plord. And I'm your co-host, Kathleen Wolfley. Today's episode is about Climate Week. We have guests from dairy companies joining us to speak about how they are helping to drive progress on the sustainability front. Today's sponsor is Serac. Serac, your reliable partner for hygienic bottle and cup filling solutions. We listen, adapt, and deliver machines for your unique needs. Trust Serac, designed and built in America. All right, Kathleen, where are we now? Spot prices. As of Wednesday, September 13th, we were trading nickels this week. Cheddar blocks closed at $1.91, down a nickel on the week. Barrels closed at $1.82, also a nickel lower. Butter closed at $2.77, a nickel higher. The non fat dry milk market closed at $1.11, up two cents. Phil, what do you think is the most important thing right now? Kathleen, I'm keying in on cheese exports. All year long, exports have been a huge factor in cheese price determination. Earlier this year, we were cheaper than the world markets and we got a bunch of exports off and prices shot higher in March when those when that was happening. And then we were not competitive and prices came down and they got so cheap in June that we were the cheapest cheese in the world by a wide margin. We believe we booked a bunch of exports in that time period. And today we're seeing that with prices going back higher because a lot of extra cheese that was coming to the exchange in Chicago is now going overseas. But we went from the cheapest in the world to the most expensive in the world in about uh, 60 days time. And so I don't think exports are going to be flowing all that much beyond the month of September. What about you? Well, just to kind of uh, double down on your point there, you mentioned this, Volume in Chicago seems to pick up when we don't ship a lot of exports and volume seems to dry up in Chicago when we do book a lot of exports. And it seems like in the last couple of weeks, we've started to see a little bit of inching higher in how much volume is trading. Yeah, it's, it's, it's barely perceptible. There's just a little bit more. And, and it's basically this. If exports are down 10 million pounds year over year, it's hard for us to immediately find a home for those 10 million pounds that aren't shipping. And so we got to 81 million pounds in July. I think the number of exports, I think will creep a little higher in August, but let's just say we drop 15 or 20 million pounds from there in October. And what do we do with that extra cheese? It's, it it yeah. tends to go to Chicago. Well, my most important thing for right now is milk production. U.S. milk supplies have been trending lower over the course of the last couple of months. We've seen pretty aggressive culling. There's been a persistent hot summer for anybody that's been (laughs) trying to do anything outside for the summer. It has been hot, but now we're into the middle of September, right? Temperatures are starting to cool off seasonally. Milk margins, at least on paper, are starting to look a little bit better. But I think there are still a lot of questions around where do we go from here? Do we start to see culling ease up a little bit? Do people start to hold on to a few more cows, milk a few more cows, add a few, few more of those frou-frou dust additives back to feed and try to boost milk production to take advantage of a little bit better milk prices? I think there are just a lot of questions around milk production going forward. But for right now, we have been trending a little bit lower over the course of the last couple months. So there's not quite as much milk around today as there was a year ago at this time. It's kind of interesting from a cheese market perspective, I would argue from a milk powder market perspective, even from a grain market perspective, there's there's sort of two different universes where we're talking about, you know, domestic, you know, domestic milk supplies tight, but lots of questions about international demand. Um, when we look at the grain markets, for example, you know, uh, at corn exports have been disappointing. So I would say the past several months have been a, a real reminder of how these hard global markets and what happens internationally definitely matters, right? Yeah, and much more so than they did even five or 10 years ago. We are an increasingly globalized market here uh, for both the U.S. dairy and arguably the U.S. grain markets as well. We watch uh, European mozzarella prices pretty carefully these days as an example. For sure. All right, Phil, what is your stat of the week? My stat of the week is 3.7%. And that was the year-over-year increase in consumer prices in August, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. 
that was up from 3.3% in July. So we, after seeing inflation come down, 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 down for several months in a row, August marked the second month where inflation ticked higher, mostly because energy prices that had been very calm all year long are now equal to or slightly above year prior levels. And so the inflation story seems better on the surface. I mean, last year we had much more inflation than we have this year. But that dynamic could change pretty radically if gasoline prices get a little frisky and we start seeing $4, four and a quarter gasoline nationally. That would really change whatever good feelings we have on inflation. Yeah, I saw that the crude market this morning was trading closer to 90 bucks a barrel, which I think we're just shy of 90 bucks today, which that would, that'll be the first time we see 90 in quite some time, right? Yeah. And then, you know, if we get to a hundred, then things get serious in my estimation. My stat of the week is negative 6.3%. Open table data for September 9th showed a decline of 6.3% in how many people were making reservations at restaurants. And that's the lowest going back to May of 2023. So who knows if that's inflation related, people are paying more in restaurants, maybe that's COVID related, maybe it's a combination of all of it, but just something to watch on the restaurant side of things that just fewer people going to restaurants that take reservations. What's your fearless prediction, Phil? I predict that the Buffalo Bills will start the season 0-1. Oh, wait, that's already happened. Ouch. That was really hurtful. <laughs> It's not like my downstate favorite New York Giants uh, had a good week either, uh, but the expectations there, I think, are quite a bit lower. But in all seriousness, my fearless prediction is, I think we have seen the cheese market high for the year. Now, there's only a few months left. I get that. The high so far was 21975 established on January 9th. The market got back up over $2 for a few days in mid-August. I don't think we're going to topple that 220-ish kind of number on cheese. Block cheddar, spot block cheddar, CME. What about you, Kathleen? Well, I'm going to double down on my milk production commentary. My fearless prediction is that milk production for August will fall by less than 1% year over year. So somewhere, I probably somewhere in that half to 1% range, but I don't think we're going to go bigger than 1%. Yeah, I think we see bigger than 1%. That, that skews to the clearly bullish side of the ledger. Well, Phil, let's get to our first guest. We're excited to welcome Britt Lundgren to the show. Britt is the Senior Director of Sustainability and Government Affairs at Stonyfield Organic, part of Lactalis USA. In that role, she leads the development and implementation of Stonyfield strategies on sustainable agriculture. Prior to joining Stonyfield, Britt spent five years as an agricultural policy specialist for the Environmental Defense Fund. Britt, welcome to the Dairy Download. Thank you. Glad to be here. So to start off today, could you tell us a little bit about Stonyfield's climate and sustainability goals and why they're a priority for the company? Yeah, sure. Stonyfield actually got its start as an organic farming school and the business came along as a way to, to grow the impact of that school. So we've really been mission driven since that start back in 1983. And we've stayed really close to those roots, both in our location here in New Hampshire, but also in keeping that mission at the heart of everything that we do. And today, you know, it's still very much at the core of our business, but we see the effects of climate change in a much more real way all around us right now. So when we started, we knew, our, our founders knew that, that climate change was a thing that was going to affect the future of our business. But now we really see this on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it really increases the urgency of this mission commitment. We started tracking our greenhouse gas emissions back in the 1990s. We were a pioneer in this work, and we were the first manufacturer to offset all of our emissions from energy usage. So we really brought that concept into the business space. And over the years, we've become a lot more formal about both our greenhouse gas accounting and our other sustainability goals. Um, 
and we've also really advanced our strategies for reducing our own emissions and moved away from an offsetting strategy in towards just looking at our own business and our own supply chain and how we can reduce those impacts. So we organize our sustainability work around four pillars, climate, protection from toxins, packaging, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, underneath each of those pillars, we've built out both short-term and long-term goals. So today, one of our big driving goals is that we have a science-based target to reduce our emissions 30% by 2030. Um, In the protection from toxins area, this is where we really lean on our organic certification. Being certified organic has always been fundamental to advancing our vision of sustainability in the world because we don't by being organic, we're not introducing um, things like chemical pesticides and synthetic fertilizers into the environment. On the packaging front, there's a lot of work to do there. And our goal is to shift to have entirely bio-based or recycled packaging materials by 2030. And then for diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, we're looking at how we can be better at advancing environmental justice in our local communities. So for us, that's here in New Hampshire. And we've started that work by supporting two organizations in the region in their environmental justice work in Manchester and the surrounding communities to really bring um, more environmental health and more access to locally grown healthy produce to local communities. Of those four pillars, which do you think has the biggest hurdle towards success? (laughs) <laughs> that is a great question. And, um, you know, they're all, I would say that climate and packaging probably compete for that honor. Um, packaging is a really stubborn issue for us. You know, we have to we sell single serve and quartz and it all comes in plastic. And when we look at the footprint of that plastic, you know, we know that we we need to move away from single use plastics, but at the same time, there aren't really good alternatives at scale in the marketplace right now. So I get asked all the time, like, why don't you make yogurt in glass? But glass is really heavy. And so from an environmental perspective, it's actually not an improvement, even though it's likely more recyclable, that's really where the benefits end. So we have we have a lot of work to do on packaging in particular. Can you talk about Stonyfield's new climate-friendly program and what it could mean for the future of sustainability in the dairy industry? Yeah, sure. We have um, two, two big initiatives away, underway that are focused on reducing the greenhouse gas impacts of the dairy farms that we source from. Um, We know that over half of Stonyfield's total greenhouse gas footprint comes just from dairy farms. So if we are going to make any progress towards hitting our science-based target, we really have to focus in on dairy. And so we do that by partnering directly with the farms that supply our milk, because we know that we need to identify solutions that are workable for the farms and compatible with the farm's overall business model. Stonyfield gets our milk from two primary sources. Most of our milk comes from the Organic Valley Fit Cooperative, which is a group of family farms based in Wisconsin. And then we get the balance of our milk from what we call our direct milk supply program. And that's farms that we contract with directly here in New England. And whether we're looking at Organic Valley or our direct milk supply all of the farms that are supplying Stonyfield's milk are here in this Northeast milk shed. So in, in the New England states, plus New York and Pennsylvania. And we really have that emphasis on regional sourcing, both because we're committed to family farms in this region, but also because we know it lowers the environmental footprint of that milk because you're reducing transport. transport. And of course, milk is heavy. So when it comes to our work with Organic Valley, we are really excited to be supporting them in um, this new Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities grant that they received this year from USDA. 
So we agreed to purchase 25,000 tons of CO2 reductions annually from their farms over a five-year period. Um, and this will be at a market rate for carbon that we agree upon with them. And our hope is that we can actually grow that over time so that we can bring ourselves to our own goal of eliminating emissions from dairy entirely from our supply chain by 2030. So Organic Valley has launched this insetting program where they're providing, they're using this partnership for climate smart commodities program to provide technical support to their farms to identify how they can reduce emissions and track those changes. And then we provide the payment per ton for the carbon that they reduce um, for a certain set of those farms. And they're going to be doing activities like agroforestry, methane reduction through enteric feed supplements, and changing their manure management systems to reduce methane emissions from manure as well. And then we're in parallel to that, we're working directly with the farms in our direct supply on emissions reductions opportunities as well. And so there we have partnered with a place called Wolf's Neck Center, which is a um, it's a farm, it's an organic dairy farm and a research center in Maine. They, they provide milk to us, but we also work with them on advancing this project called Open Team, which stands for Open Technology Ecosystem for Agriculture Management. And Open Team is building out a suite of tools and building interoperability between these tools to connect farm record keeping with monitoring what's happening on farm emissions and soil health so that we can really streamline this process for farmers of tracking when they make a change to management, tracking how that drives change in soil or reduces emissions elsewhere, and make it kind of a one-stop shopping experience for the farmer so that it's really uh, minimal additional effort on their part to actually track these activities over time. And so we've got a lot of activities underway. We have a set of 16 pilot farms that we're working with on that work in our direct supply as well. So we're trying a lot of different things right now and um, really hoping that we can see what sticks and what's going to be most effective over time at really driving change at the farm level. Speaking of the farms and farmers, how has Stonyfield found its interaction with farmers to be around this topic? Are your producers embracing the goals? How is that dynamic working? Yeah, the producers that we work with have been really eager, actually, to step up and participate in our work on Open Team and in other projects related to reducing farm emissions. And I think that this is driven by a couple of things. When I started working on um, agriculture and climate change at the intersection of those issues, it was it always felt kind of dangerous to say the words climate change to a farmer because you never knew how they were going to react. But I think over time, it's just become impossible not to see the changes that are happening in the weather and in the environment that are really impacting productivity at the farm level. And also, dairy farmers are under increasing criticism from people who are concerned about methane emissions from cattle. And I think that our farmers are hearing this and they really want an opportunity to demonstrate to the public all of the good things that they have underway to advance sustainability. I think it's also important, you know, we have really been careful in our work not to ask farmers to do things that are going to have a significant impact on their bottom line, unless we are going to find a way to financially support the farms in making that change. So we're very carefully careful in how we bring this work to farmers, but we are really glad that our farmers are willing to work with us on it. So how are other dairy companies using USDA funding to expand their sustainability programs? There is a ton of opportunity for dairy companies to be working with USDA right now on um, on identifying opportunities to work with their farms to reduce emissions and otherwise improve sustainability. And a lot of that is flowing from the funds that were in the Inflation Reduction Act. And these funds um, are mostly flowing through NRCS, through the conservation programs and the RCPP program, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. I think that's what that acronym stands for. Um, 
but they also are flowing through the rural development program and the um, renewable energy for America program that's managed there. And I think in either case, um, the first step for companies is really just to reach out to USDA and they can do this um, at the state level, particularly if you're headquartered in a state, it makes sense to reach out to the state that you're based in, to the state conservationist for NRCS or the rural development lead for that state. Um, and just sit down and talk to them about what your company is interested in supporting, how you work with your farms, and how you might be able to team up with NRCS and rural development to bring a group of farmers to the table to adopt conservation practices with NRCS support. Stonyfield actually just put in an application to the RCPP program, so we're still waiting on news of whether our farms will be able to receive these funds. Um, but we work together with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. They were really fantastic partners in helping us pull together an application and, and work with NRCS state conservationists to understand what made sense from the state perspective and get that application submitted. So we're hopeful that we might be able to bring some more funds. This was looking specifically at ways to reduce emissions from manure management on the farm. Our farms are smaller than, than your average dairy. So our average herd size is about 80 cows for Stonyfield Direct Supply Program. And so that means that our solutions for reducing emissions from manure management are going to be substantially different from what you might do on a 500 cow dairy or a 1,000 cow dairy. And so we're really excited about this opportunity that RCPP creates to bring a focus to farms at that scale and see if we can drive some better solutions to reduce emissions from farms with that kind of management system. Um, the other thing I'll note here is I learned uh, recently that rural development is going to be rolling out um, new technical assistance leads in every state that are focused on helping connect farmers with renewable energy opportunities in their state. So I think this is just getting underway. I'm not even sure if it's um, in place yet, but it's, I think, great timing to reach out to your state rural development director and find out more about it so that the farms that you're working with can be um, teed up to engage in this program. Yeah, we have um, really approached all of our work on reducing greenhouse gas emissions in, in our full supply chain from the partnership perspective. And um, truly believe in the importance of pre-competitive collaboration. We need to be able to learn from each other and we need to be able to support each other in this sustainability journey. We're all trying to produce food on the same planet. You know, we all share the same challenges and climate change is really escalating all of those challenges in a way that brings a lot of urgency to finding solutions. And I think forces us to set aside competitive concerns that might might steer companies towards trying to go it alone. We're going to learn a lot more. We're going to solve things a lot faster if we work on them together. Let's think about the future. What do you see as promising opportunities for programs related to sustainability for the dairy industry in the next, say, three to five to 10 years? Yeah, there's a lot of exciting research happening right now on different strategies for reducing emissions from dairy. And so some of that I, I am very excited about. For instance, we're engaged with um, a group called Bigelow Labs out of Maine in looking at um, seaweed as an opportunity to reduce methane emissions from uh, enteric fermentation. And Bigelow is looking at the potential for using North Atlantic varieties of seaweed. So everyone's been very excited about this red seaweed from the South Pacific called Asparagopsis, which has incredible potential to reduce enteric fermentation in ruminants. But, um, you know, no one has really cracked the nut, as far as we can tell, on producing that red seaweed commercially. And if we can identify a regional variety of seaweed, 
that would have benefits from an environmental standpoint um, for the ocean and for the rural communities that harvest that seaweed, as well as the environmental benefits that could come from feeding that seaweed to our cows. So Bigelow is looking at different ways of um, utilizing some North Atlantic varieties, like fermenting them, which may unlock more methane reduction potential from that seaweed. So there's some really cool research going on like that. And then there's also, I think, just this bigger picture opportunity to make sure that we are collectively advancing more scale appropriate solutions for reducing emissions from dairy farms. I think the industry, the dairy industry writ large has been really focused on things like using um, digesters to reduce methane emissions from manure lagoons. And, you know, that ha certainly has its place and it, a need for that, but it's not an effective solution for small scale farms. They may not have a liquid manure pit. Um, they may not have a big enough manure pit to be cost effective to install a digester. And if we want agriculture to truly become a part of the solution for climate change, we need to find ways to bring along farms at all scales. Well, Britt, thank you so much for being part of the Dairy Download. Happy to. It was great talking to you both. Now let's hear a little bit more about methane. We're excited to welcome Chris Adamo to the show. Chris is Vice President of Public Affairs and Regenerative Agricultural Policy for Danone North America. In that role, he assists the world's largest B Corp with strengthening its role in driving social and environmental good for all. Prior to joining the team at Danone, Chris spent over a decade working at the highest levels of the federal government, including a stint as Chief of Staff for President Obama's White House Council on Environmental Quality and as a staff director for the U.S. Senate Committee on Ag, Nutrition, and Forestry under Senator Debbie Stabenow. Chris, thanks for joining us and welcome to the Dairy Download. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So let's get right after it. Can you share what Danone's greenhouse gas commitments are to date and why the company has looked at separating methane out of the company's total emissions profile as a strategy? Yeah, sure thing. So stepping back a little bit, just why climate change and, and our involvement in uh, climate change as a part of our sustainability strategy, it's, it's certainly not new. Um, this has been something on our radar for, for quite some time now. So as a general um, way of looking at it, we've been you know, a part of a net zero ambition uh, under the Science-Based Target Initiative for the past four or five years. Um, we recently had our what they call scope three. So the supply chain, our, which is a bulk, bulk of which is our farming supply chain, uh, bulk of which is dairy. And we recently had that certified this past year under the science-based target initiative. So we've been scoping out a strategy to um, significantly decrease the carbon intensity of our, of our entire business uh, for the past four or five years now. And as we look at it, Agriculture is a big part of that opportunity to to drive the business into a more sustainable, more resilient model. And, you know, roughly two thirds of it is agriculture. Roughly uh, half of that is dairy. And then when we break down the dairy, as everybody knows, methane is a significant portion of that overall pie of, of any average dairy. And of course, it can fluctuate depending on the size of dairy, depending on the location of the dairy and the type of management. But generally speaking, methane is going to be more, you know, more than half um, or so of the overall dairy footprint. And that's not to say that cropland and CO2 isn't important. Um, N2O is important. You know, we still are looking at a very strategic, holistic approach um, with working with our farms, but it goes without saying that methane is, is the big portion of the pie. So over the last couple of years, we started to understand the science a little bit better and, uh, through some of our partners, through some of our coalitions that methane We've known for some time now that methane is more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, for example, about eight times more potent. But there's a short term opportunity with methane for society. If we can take on methane and we can significantly reduce it as a society uh, in the, say, coming five to 10 years, it improves our overall chances at uh, mitigating catastrophic warming across the planet. And, you know, with methane, most of it's oil and gas, right? So there's been a, a huge focus, rightfully so, on the oil and gas industry to reduce methane, say, leaks from pipelines, for example. Um, but agriculture is number two. Uh, dairies, you know, there's a lot of pieces to this pie, right? Beef is important. Dairy is important. Uh, rice is important, for example. But as you all know, the dairy industry, we've been at this now for some time. We understand our 
our levers, we understand our scope. And so it just made sense to us to call out the obvious, which is methane is a big part of the strategy and, and increasingly so a priority of the strategy. And then can you offer any thoughts on how the industry is going after the methane question and where Danone plays a role in that? Yeah, look, and I think this the industry has done a really good job at this. I mean, you think about our partners, uh, certainly through IDFA, certainly through Dairy Management Inc., uh, through Global Dairy Platform and the Net Zero Pathways. As an industry, we've mapped out, generally speaking, what the macro levers are, right? So when we think about our key uh, buckets of levers, it's 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 anybody who knows a dairy, this is going to be very obvious. It's herd management, you know, how the how the cows are managed, how the how they're fed, what the genomics are, um, animal welfare components, a big bucket of animal uh, herd management levers that are available to us. And that's good business, right? That's driving efficiency in most cases. That's dri- trying to get more milk per animal uh, on a smaller footprint at the end of the day. The second bucket, which again, everybody knows about is manure management. And then third, I'm going to call it the innovation bucket. This is primarily for enteric uh, the burps, the the ruminant digestion, as we all know, which is a huge component of of any uh, dairies again methane footprint, and you know this gets into what's coming down the pipeline. There are a few things starting to emerge in the marketplace right now. Uh, for example, in Europe and parts of Latin America, we have a product from DSM called Bovair uh, that's starting to make it out there. Just just one example. This is one of the more recent um, feed additives that are in that are coming as a part of the innovations. But we expect more to be coming down the pipeline, and we're looking actively looking at um, how can we accelerate some of these new solutions for that innovation bucket. Talk a little bit more about the ruminant feed additives and what their role is in reducing emissions. Do you think it's a game changer for U.S. dairies, um, or do you think it's just a, another piece of the puzzle? I think it's a little both. It's I I I don't want to hesitate a little bit with game changer only because I don't want to give the impression that that's all we need, right? I think fundamentally, and this is a part of our strategy working with farms across the globe, whether it's in the U.S., Europe, Africa, wherever we're working, we want to get that first bucket right first, right? Herd management that is good business. That's good farming. How do we help farmers? How do we partner with farmers? Just increase the efficiency of their business. So. Those are kind of the fun. Think of those as the fundamentals, the foundation of of a good farm. And some farms are doing it really well. And then there's always room for continuous improvement, right? We as a business, there's always room for continuous improvement. So and then manure is always going to be an issue, right? I mean, how do you store that waste? How does that waste get managed? Can you create a value stream out of that waste through um, better fertilizer inputs, for example, or through an anaerobic digester? So those are really important. Those aren't going away, right? We still need those two buckets of levers no matter what. Um, so, you know, but <laughs> we need these new innovations as well, because, you know, look at Bovair, we're looking at anywhere from an 18 to 30 percent methane reduction um, per cow uh, just using that. That's that's significant. Right. That is a big swipe uh, of the methane pie. Certainly we can get also big uh, reductions through different manure management, too. I'll give you an example. You want to talk game changer on the manure side? Liquid solid separators, we think, is a game changer for many farms, right? It's a huge reduction in methane, anywhere from 25 to 35%, uh, depending on how it's managed. And you get that cropland benefit as well through a more efficient uh, fertilizer input. So there's a lot of game changers here. I think we have to lift up all these big bets. But certainly, uh, you know, for Danone, we look, we've staked out that we were going to look at a 30% net reduction across our entire global operations of dairy methane by 2030. We need those enteric innovations to be a part of the other two as well. So it's super important. You talked about uh, solids, liquid solid separators. Do you think that digesters are in that same bucket of being crucial for essentially moving the ball forward? Absolutely. I think the interesting thing, and this is, um, you know, somebody who worked in government and policy over the last 15 plus years, uh, I can think back to, you know, working in the U.S. Senate back in 2007, 2008, when we were passing energy bills and farm bills and 2009, 2010, where we had a failed climate bill. We were talking about anaerobic digesters then, right? And they're not, this is not a new technology in that sense. Um, but you know, there's a lot of barriers to bringing an anaerobic digester onto a dairy. It takes up a huge footprint. Um, it can have a lot of risk for the farm if they have to fix a mechanical issue. 
Um, who's going to buy that biogas? I mean, there's a lot of layers. And of course, the technology is improving over the last decade. Um, and we're seeing a little bit of a proliferation of them right now in the U.S. But you have to ask, why is that? It's because there's a couple policies that are really lifting up that economic opportunity for the farm to do it. So it's a huge opportunity, but it's not going to be available necessarily for every farm, at least not yet. Um, it's But we're excited that more farms can potentially talk to an energy developer about having it on their farm. And that's due to the California low carbon fuel standard. It's due to state renewable energy standards. We need, people need that biogas. Therefore, there's that economic driver to develop at farms, which is great. We're seeing that in Europe too. Places like Belgium, places like Spain, we're seeing those same opportunities. But then go talk to a 350 cow uh, dairy in central Ohio. They may not have that same opportunity because they're not producing enough waste for that developer to be economically attractive. So we're hopeful that there'll be some community projects, some co-mingling of waste streams that might open the doors for more size uh, dairies at the end of the day. I think that that's happening and I think we're going to see more of it. But what I what going back to the liquid solid separator, what gets us really excited about that is it's something that generally can be deployed and found beneficial from an economic standpoint across any size dairy, just about, right? And they do have a huge economic uh, cost as well, right? I and mean, these things can be three quarters of a million dollars here in the US to uh, design and deploy. So the average farm is probably not too excited about you know going out and getting a loan for that. So we still need creative partnerships. We still need creative financing, creative USDA programs to help deploy those, uh, which we are working on and, and unlocking right now. But again, going back to the two, it's not an either or. We might even see some farms using both. Let's hone in a little bit on that producer relationship or you know how Danone and others are working you know are, are producers embracing uh, this movement uh, how how are you working with producers and how's that relationship evolving on these topics so when we announced our methane reduction uh, initiative back in January uh, and this was a global initiative mind you and, and our CEO uh, penned an op-ed with Fred Krupp the the CEO of environmental defense fund and the Financial Times and you know, it was it was a pretty big splash. Right. And so rightfully so, this was a, a big new thing. But the message to our farming partners at the time, and, and I helped deliver this in front of about 150 of them uh, at our in our U.S. dairy uh, forum last winter was, guys, this is exactly what we've been talking about. There's actually nothing new here from your standpoint. We're going to look more aggressively at certain methane pieces where it makes sense for you. We're not forcing this on any farm. This has got to be a, a, a co-beneficial, co-mutual uh, decision-making process where the farm wants to take on some of these new solutions. Uh, so our message was, this is what we've been mapping out for years. Um, we've, you know, we've had 14 different pilots over the last five years in 14 different countries working on everything from cropland to, to improved herd management to improved manure management. So we've been learning about many of these solutions for years now with our farming partners. So from their standpoint, got, again, we've been scoping out these solutions uh, for years. This is nothing new. We may, where it makes sense, prioritize these methane uh, opportunities with the farm. So, you know, I think they, they understood that. They've, they've been on this path with us. You talked a little bit about partnerships earlier. Can you talk about the partnerships you have with the Environmental Defense Fund and Global Methane Hub? How do those partnerships advance the ball? Partnerships, I think, take many, many forms. Um, sometimes they're official, contractual. We sign on a dotted line and, and we have these you know, consultants or we have uh, we might donate to a nonprofit. So that we, we have been building partnerships of different sorts across our value chain for these purposes for years now. Environmental Defense Fund is a fascinating example of a partnership, and it's one I'm super excited about because I think it's different and unique and one that we're actually still learning from. Uh, so when we when we announced our methane initiative in January this year, um, EDF, you know, which is the, the short acronym for Environmental Defense Fund, they obviously validated it. They amplified it. They were very uh, celebratory of us putting that out in public, which, by the way, also wasn't just a 30% um, commitment or, or initiative to reduce by 2030, but it was also about reporting the methane on an annual basis, which typically greenhouse gas is done in CO2E, as you guys know. So we're, we're breaking out or the methane in addition to that CO2E. Um, EDF is, I mean, we have an MOU with them. We have a memorandum of understanding. We pay them nothing. They promise us nothing. 
It is literally a, uh, a back and forth conversation. They're a thought partnership. They're, uh, they're a, a whiteboard to brainstorm with. We bounce ideas back and forth from each other. We learn from each other, frankly. And it's, it's got to be a co-beneficial uh, relationship. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to withstand the test of time. But so far, we have, and this is kind of what we outlined at the beginning with our memorandum of understanding, but three kind of major components. One is to just understand the science better. You know, in the science, that, that could be us learning about why methane. Um, but it also could be about, well, how do we measure methane better? What are the tools to measure methane better? Financing uh, is another bucket that they're helping with. Uh, what are creative financing tools that are out there? Uh, and policy. You know, what are the different policy tools, you know, whether it's a Department of Agriculture uh, grant or cost share or research initiative around enteric. Um, I'll just give you an example. This pat- in Congress right now, and, and IDFA was, has been super helpful with this as well. There is a, a piece of legislation to try and streamline the regulatory approval system at our FDA, our Food Drug Administration here in the U.S. And that's not, you know, FDA is typically not always a place that most farmers are, are following or aware of. But the reason it's important is that this new regulatory process, if it passes into law, could make it easier for more feed additives to get into the market quicker. So I'll give you an example. We have a, a company called Symbrosia that we work with. It's a seaweed company. And, you know, it's, as, as it sounds, it's a natural product that could be an interesting part of uh, a cow's feed ration. That's not a pharmaceutical product, right? So we need a pro, an appropriate regulatory system to look at its safety, uh, to human health, to animal health, and, and get it out on the market as soon as possible, if it makes sense. So that's just one example. EDF brought this to light for us. They said, hey, there's a fix that we think is available, that smart policy. Uh, to get more of these products available to farms. And so we, they helped us and in, in, in industry really lift this up into the congressional conversation this year. I think it's no secret at this point that dairy seems to gather a lot of attention in some of these conversations. And Danone is a, you know, obviously a major player in the global dairy world. Will Danone be attending the COP28 meeting in Dubai? And what's your vision for spreading the word about the methane action agenda ahead of that meeting and at the event? Yeah, great question. So I, a couple things. One, and this is goes back to why we announced the, our methane initiative. We think there's a great story to tell here. We think there's great work that can be done with dairies to make dairies more efficient, more affordable, more accessible for more, more consumers at the end of the day. So being a part of these sorts of international global conversations and, and frankly, domestic conversations too, both in the U, EU and in the US, for example, uh, we want to be present. We want to be telling Dairy's story in a positive frame uh, to really highlight all the what we think are amazing opportunities for us and for farmers to to co-invest and um, execute together. So, yeah, the COP is incredibly important to be at. And we generally are there most years. And food is going to be a bigger part of this conversation than ever. We know that all food, all agriculture and our view, and you know, I think the view of, of partners like EDF, is that we think there's a positive story to tell. We want to amplify those stories. We're hoping you know, that you know, we'll be there one way or another, but hopefully we'll have uh, a large industry contingent in the dairy sector to, to be there promoting uh, the good work that, that we all have uh, underway. So if, if you know anything about dairy, you know that the projects that we're, you're, you've been talking about, they cost money, right? Are there any promising financing or collaborative approaches to help the dairy supply chain, farmers in particular, finance methane or manure management? And how is Danone helping encourage, fund, or incentivize farm-level investment? There isn't one silver bullet to this, at least not yet. So we're we are exploring a number of different ways to help finance this with farms. I think first and foremost, um, I have to applaud the company. We've had a number of years now where, and this is not easy, but we have been dedicating internal resources to working with farms. We have in, here in the U.S., we have an agriculture team. We have a milk team that's out. I mean, these are folks that are experts in dairy. They can talk to a dairy. They can help them analyze, you know, what, what, what improvements uh, what opportunities might exist. Um, we work with a partner called Sustainable Environmental Consultants They're out of Des Moines, Iowa. They do the data collection. They do the planning for the farm. And that's coming out of our budget. We're paying that for the farms that want to be a part of this program. And, and then we're, we're putting significant resources on an annual basis right now into specific farm projects. A couple other things to add to that. 
again, because it's got to be a, a spectrum of strategic opportunities to co-finance. One is just contracting. Sometimes some of our farms, not all, but a good portion of our milk supply in the U.S. is through what's called a cost plus model contract. That really does change. It's a multi-year offtake effectively where Danone is picking up some of the risk for the costs of doing business. And so we can sometimes factor in new investments into that contract where, again, we're picking up a good chunk of the weight. And if there's economic ROI, economic efficiencies, we can we can share in that with the farm. So that model contract does allow us to be creative in a lot of ways. And then, you know, there are we've got to look to government policy as well. But the thing that's really and I would call this a game changer because I truly believe in its its promise over the past uh, really 10 years now, our Department of Agriculture and our um, our U.S. Congress uh, supporters through the agriculture committees have been promoting public-private partnership opportunities. And what that allows is you know, non-federal entities, whether it's a Danone or whether it's a cooperative or whether it's a, an, a nonprofit organization, can apply to the USDA with a strategy and say, hey, this strategy is going to do outreach to X number of farms in these particular regions for any particular set of practices. Last year, many of you may have heard uh, the Department of Agriculture announced a Climate Smart initiative, and they put an unprecedented amount of resources on the table. Ultimately, they have agreed to $3 billion in Climate Smart grants, which is, again, pretty incredible moment in time to take advantage of. We are fortunate we put together a, a, a proposal with a number of other partners in our value chain and are a part of a partnership that has $70 million to put out to farmers for various climate uh, mitigation, climate adaptation activities. Of that $70 million, this is super exciting because it's about to start for us, we're going to have $23 million going to manure projects and methane, for example. And so those dollars match up with our resources. Those dollars match up with other partners' resources to really try and scale and accelerate manure projects across our supply chain. So a lot of those might be liquid solid separators, some might be compost barns, could be other manure injection systems that, that farms are interested in using. But bottom line, we expect significant methane savings from out of that partnership and out of that um, assistance from our, our federal government. Thank you so much for joining us on the Dairy Download. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. That's a wrap for today's show. As always, we want to thank our production team, Matt Herrick, Mariah McKenzie, Michael Gooden, and Andrew Jerome at IDFA, and Corey Romero over here at EverAg Insights. If you're interested in what Kathleen and I do for our day jobs, check us out at ever.ag. If you are interested in our publications and shows, go to our new website at insights.ever.ag. Remember, if you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again to today's sponsor, Serac. At Serac, we listen, adapt, and deliver machines for your unique needs. Serac is your reliable partner for hygienic bottle and cup solutions. Serac machines are built in America. Thanks for listening to the Dairy Download. Until next time, stay sharp. Stay sharp.